Hey, I think it's great that you've joined me today, so welcome, and this is day number 184. Today we read 1 Kings 17 and 18, Psalm 120, and John 9. So let's turn to 1 Kings 17. We've arrived at the narrative of the different kings of Judah, which includes the smaller tribe of Benjamin, and the kings of Israel, consisting of the ten other tribes, sometimes called the northern kingdom. The kings on the Israel side change more rapidly and are 100% bad, while there is a mixed record among the kings of Judah. It will help your understanding to observe the section headings which I normally do not read, and to try to remember which kingdom is being talked about. Note in yesterday's reading how prophecy was fulfilled again and again, and although Baasha fulfilled the murderous prophecy against the house of Jeroboam, in chapter 16, verse 7, in God's view, the murders he committed were still counted against Baasha as sin. God's sovereignty and omniscience does not conflict with our own personal responsibility for sin. 1 Kings 17 A prophet named Elijah from Tishbe in Gilead said to King Ahab, In the name of the Lord, the living God of Israel, whom I serve, I tell you that there will be no dew or rain for the next two or three years until I say so. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Leave this place and go east and hide yourself near Cherith Brook, east of the Jordan. The brook will supply you with water to drink, and I have commanded ravens to bring you food there. Elijah obeyed the Lord's command and went and stayed by Cherith Brook. He drank water from the brook, and ravens brought him bread and meat every morning and every evening. After a while, the brook dried up because of the lack of rain. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Now go to the town of Zarephath, near Sidon, and stay there. I have commanded a widow who lives there to feed you. So Elijah went to Zarephath, and as he came to the town gate, he saw a widow gathering firewood. He said to her, Please bring me a drink of water. And as she was going to get it, he called out, And please bring me some bread, too. She answered, By the living Lord our God, I swear that I don't have any bread. All I have is a handful of flour in a bowl and a bit of olive oil in a jar. I came here to gather some firewood to take back home and prepare what little I have for my son and me. That will be our last meal, and then we will starve to death. Elijah said to her, Don't worry, go on and prepare your meal, but first make a small loaf from what you have and bring it to me and then prepare the rest for you and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, The bowl will not run out of flour, or the jar run out of oil, before the day that I, the Lord, send rain. The widow went and did as Elijah had told her, and all of them had enough food for many days. As the Lord had promised through Elijah, the bowl did not run out of flour, nor did the jar run out of oil. Sometime later, the widow's son got sick. He got worse and worse, and finally he died. She said to Elijah, Man of God, why did you do this to me? Did you come here to remind God of my sins, and so cause my son's death? Give the boy to me, Elijah said. He took the boy from her arms, carried him upstairs to the room where he was staying, and laid him on the bed. Then he prayed aloud, O Lord my God, why have you done such a terrible thing to this widow? She has been kind enough to take care of me, and now you kill her son? Then Elijah stretched himself out on the boy three times and prayed, O Lord my God, restore this child to life. 
The Lord answered Elijah's prayer. The child started breathing again and revived. Elijah took the boy back downstairs to his mother and said to her, Look, your son is alive. She answered, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the Lord really speaks through you. 1 Kings 18 After some time, in the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, Go and present yourself to King Ahab, and I will send rain. So Elijah started out. The famine in Samaria was at its worst, so Ahab called in Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. Obadiah was a devout worshiper of the Lord, and when Jezebel had been killing the Lord's prophets, Obadiah took a hundred of them, hid them in caves in two groups of fifty, and provided them with food and water. Ahab said to Obadiah, Let's go look at every spring and every stream bed in the land to see if we can find enough grass to keep the horses and mules alive. Maybe we won't have to kill any of our animals. They agreed on which part of the land each one would explore and set off in different directions. As Obadiah was on his way, he suddenly met Elijah. He recognized him, bowed low before him, and asked, Is it really you, sir? He answered, Yes, I'm Elijah. Go and tell your master the king that I'm here. Obadiah answered, What have I done that you want to put me in danger of being killed by King Ahab? By the living Lord your God, I swear that the king has made a search for you in every country in the world. Whenever the ruler of a country reported that you were not in his country, Ahab would require that ruler to swear that you could not be found. And now you want me to go and tell him that you're here? What if the Spirit of the Lord carries you off to some unknown place as soon as I leave? Then, when I tell Ahab that you're here and he can't find you, he'll put me to death. Remember that I have been a devout worshiper of the Lord ever since I was a boy. Haven't you heard that when Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord, I hid a hundred of them in caves, in two groups of fifty, and supplied them with food and water? So how can you order me to go and tell the king that you're here? He'll kill me. Elijah answered, By the living Lord Almighty, whom I serve, I promise that I will present myself to the king today. So Obadiah went to King Ahab and told him, and Ahab set off to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw him, he said, So there you are, the worst troublemaker in Israel. Elijah answered, I'm not the troublemaker. You are, you and your father. You are disobeying the Lord's commands and worshiping the idols of Baal. Now order all the people of Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel. Bring along the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah, who are supported by Queen Jezebel. So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and the prophets of Baal to meet at Mount Carmel. Elijah went up to the people and said, How much longer will it take you to make up your minds? If the Lord is God, worship him. But if Baal is God, worship him. But the people didn't say a word. Then Elijah said, I am the only prophet of the Lord still left but there are 450 prophets of Baal. Bring two bulls. Let the prophets of Baal take one, kill it and cut it in pieces and put it on the wood, but don't light the fire. I will do the same with the other bull. Then let the prophets of Baal pray to their God, and I will pray to the Lord. And the one who answers by sending fire, he is God. The people shouted their approval. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Since there are so many of you, you take a bull and prepare it first. Pray to your God, but don't set fire to the wood. They took the bull that was brought to them, prepared it, and prayed to Baal until noon. 
they shouted, Answer us, Baal! and kept dancing around the altar they had built, but no answer came. At noon, Elijah started making fun of them. Pray louder! He is a god! Maybe he is daydreaming or relieving himself, or perhaps he's gone off on a trip, or maybe he's sleeping and you've got to wake him up. So the prophets prayed louder and cut themselves with knives and daggers according to their ritual until blood flowed. They kept on ranting and raving until the middle of the afternoon, but no answer came, not a sound was heard. Then Elijah said to the people, Come closer to me. And they all gathered around him. He set about repairing the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. He took twelve stones, one for each of the twelve tribes named after the sons of Jacob, the man to whom the Lord had given the name Israel. With these stones he rebuilt the altar for the worship of the Lord. He dug a trench around it, large enough to hold about four gallons of water. Then he placed the wood on the altar, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. He said, Fill four jars with water, and pour it on the offering and the wood. They did so, and he said, Do it again, and they did. Do it once more, he said, and they did. The water ran down around the altar and filled the trench. At the hour of the afternoon sacrifice, the prophet Elijah approached the altar and prayed, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove now that you are the God of Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all this at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that the people will know that you, the Lord, are God, and that you are bringing them back to yourself. The Lord sent fire down, and it burned up the sacrifice, the wood, and the stones, scorched the earth, and dried up the water in the trench. When the people saw this, they threw themselves on the ground and exclaimed, The Lord is God! The Lord alone is God! Elijah ordered, Seize the prophets of Baal! Don't let any of them get away! The people seized them all, and Elijah led them down to Kishon Brook and killed them. Then Elijah said to King Ahab, Now go and eat. I hear the roar of rain approaching. While Ahab went to eat, Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, where he bowed down to the ground with his head between his knees. He said to his servant, Go and look toward the sea. The servant went and returned, saying, I didn't see anything. Seven times in all, Elijah told him to go and look. The seventh time he returned and said, I saw a little cloud no bigger than a man's hand coming up from the sea. Elijah ordered his servant, Go to King Ahab and tell him to get in his chariot and go back home before the rain stops him. In a little while the sky was covered with dark clouds, the wind began to blow, and a heavy rain began to fall. Ahab got in his chariot and started back to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah. He fastened his clothes tight around his waist and ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now let's turn to Psalm 120. This Psalm 120 is the first of the Songs of Ascent. The HCSB Study Bible says about the Songs of Ascent, These Psalms were designed for pilgrimage processions to celebrate seasonal feasts in Jerusalem. The hymns contain numerous references to Jerusalem or Zion, the Temple, Israel, peace, and adversity. The fifteen songs, adapted from ancient hymns heralding the blessings and salvation of Zion, may have been sung on the fifteen steps leading up to the temple. Psalm 120 
When I was in trouble, when I was in trouble, I called to the Lord, and He answered me. Save me, Lord, from liars and deceivers. You liars, what will God do to you? How will He punish you? With a soldier's sharp arrows and with red hot coals. Living among you is as bad as living in Meshech or among the people of Kedar. I have lived too long with people who hate peace. When I speak of peace, they are for war. Now let's turn to John 9. Ever since I was in high school, this has been my favorite chapter of the Bible. This dates from the time that I found a tract from the American Bible Society in the rack in the foyer of our church. So in Indonesia also, I have made this chapter into a little book containing our translation. I like giving this chapter out to people I meet. Why? It is not because it answers people's questions. It is because this chapter makes people ask the most important questions. John 9 As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind. His disciples asked him, Teacher, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his own or his parents' sin? Jesus answered, his blindness has nothing to do with his sins or his parents' sins. He is blind so that God's power might be seen at work in him. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light for the world. After he said this, Jesus spat on the ground and made some mud with the spittle. He rubbed the mud on the man's eyes and told him, Go and wash your face in the pool of Siloam. The name of the pool means scent. So the man went, washed his face, and came back seeing. His neighbors then and the people who had seen him begging before this asked, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, He's the one. But others said, No, he isn't. He just looks like him. So the man himself said, I'm the man. They asked him, How is it that you can now see? He answered, The man called Jesus, made some mud, rubbed it on my eyes, and told me to go to Siloam and wash my face. So I went, and as soon as I washed, I could see. They asked, Where is he? He answered, I don't know. Then they took to the Pharisees the man who had been blind, the day that Jesus made mud and cured him of his blindness was a Sabbath. The Pharisees then asked the man again how he had received his sight. He told them, he put some mud on my eyes, I washed my face, and now I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, The man who did this cannot be from God, for he doesn't obey the Sabbath law. Others, however, said, How could a man who is a sinner perform such miracles as these? And there was a division among them. So the Pharisees asked the man once more, you say he cured you of your blindness. Well, what do you say about him? The man answered, He's a prophet. The Jewish authorities, however, were not willing to believe that he had been blind and could now see until they called his parents and asked them, Is this your son? You say that he was born blind. How is it then that he can now see? His parents answered, uh, we know that he is our son, and we know that he was born blind, but we don't know how it is that he is now able to see, nor do we know who cured him of his blindness. Ask him. He's old enough, and he can answer for himself. 
His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, who had already agreed that anyone who said he believed that Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogues. That is why his parents said, He is old enough. Ask him. A second time they called back the man who had been born blind and said to him, Promise before God that you will tell the truth. We know that this man who cured you is a sinner. The man replied, I don't know if he is a sinner or not. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. They asked, What did he do to you? How did he cure you of your blindness? He answered, I have already told you, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Maybe you too would like to be his disciples. They insulted him and said, You are that fellow's disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for that fellow, however, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, What a strange thing that is. You do not know where he comes from, but he cured me of my blindness. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He does listen to people who respect him and do what he wants them to do. Since the beginning of the world, nobody has ever heard of anyone giving sight to a person born blind. Unless this man came from God, he would not be able to do a thing. They answered, You were born and brought up in sin, and you're trying to teach us? And they expelled him from the synagogues. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Tell me who he is, sir, so that I can believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have already seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you now. The man said, I believe, Lord and knelt down before Jesus. Jesus said, I came to this world to judge, so that the blind should see, and those who see should become blind. Some Pharisees who were there with him heard him say this and asked him, Surely you don't mean that we're blind too? Jesus answered, if you were blind, then you would not be guilty. But since you claim that you can see, this means that you are still guilty. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we praise you as the light of the world. We are living in your light now and before the darkness of the last day overwhelms us, we pray that we could still be busy doing your work. Lord, we thank you for the insight that is still true today. Not all sickness is caused by sin. That man being blind was so that God's power might be seen in him. And I believe this was true whether or not you healed him. Lord, I ask that you give us mature thinking regarding illnesses, especially so that we not judge people inappropriately. And we pray that you would transform us like you did that healed blind man. May we similarly radiate your glory so that people ask, is that the same person? Give us wisdom to answer people who ask us questions, like the wisdom you gave the blind man. May we also freely admit, I don't know the answer, but one thing I know, I was blind and now I see.